Last month, a series of wildfires tore through greater Los Angeles with a loss of at least 29 lives and over 16,000 buildings. The whole region seemed vulnerable. How could this have happened? Don't blame the trees. You can see that they didn't burn nearly as much as people's homes and possessions. Don't blame LA's climate, which was not particularly fire-prone before settlement. In fact, it's the current pattern of settlement that has dried out the LA basin. This is why simply rebuilding after the fires will leave LA more vulnerable. Sadly, LA will keep burning until it gets serious about regrowing its ecosystems, both wild and urban. In today's episode, I'll provide a first few hints as to how that might be done. Welcome to Edenicity, Best Practices for Sustainably Abundant Cities. While we're on this slide, I just want to take a moment to directly address anybody who survived the fires. You have my deepest sympathy, and I'm sorry for your losses. Most of what I'm going to say in this episode is long-term planning and probably does not immediately apply to your situation. The only thing I can think of that might apply is from my own experiences as a foster parent and having gone through a large building fire as a small child, which is nothing compared to the trauma that you lived through, but it did provide one surprising clue I'll share with you now. If you have young children, it's really important to sit down and talk with them about how to respond to trauma. Because at some point, when they're away from home, perhaps at a friend's house or at a school event, they're going to see a plume like this or smell smoke. And I can tell you from experience, there will be situations where children will panic and flee. And I think it helps to anticipate those situations ahead of time, talk about the importance of sticking close to the responsible adult and of how it's much worse to get separated from everyone else, especially in an emergency situation. With that said, let's get into it. To Edenize burned landscapes, we need to do a bunch of things which I've organized into four fairly arbitrary categories. Reshape, rehydrate, reforest, and redevelop. While there are sequences to each of these, all four of these need to be happening nearly simultaneously to achieve their best effect. Let's start with reshaping the land for water retention. Now, there's a certain amount of recovery work that is happening right now, I'm sure, where people are putting in check dams, straw and wattle. This may come as a surprise to many, but after a big fire, one of the big concerns is flooding, because when the rain comes, the soils are often denuded of vegetation that would otherwise absorb a lot of the rainwater, and the ground surface itself may be scorched and hydrophobic, meaning that the water just sheets off of it rather than soaking in. So a lot of the emergency recovery work that's probably going on right now has to do with putting in straw and wattle or other fabric check dams, and in some locations, ripping scorched soil on lines of constant contour. But once these are done, it's time to Edenize. And this involves intensifying our work with the land. So our first step would be contour excavations, otherwise known as swales, to slow spread and soak rainwater. We do this on slopes less than 18 degrees. There are some soil limitations that can be addressed by consulting county soil maps. But in general, swales are tree planting systems that are specifically designed to mitigate floods and droughts. They do this by storing water along their extent, which can wrap around ridges, rehydrating areas that typically dry out quickest. By connecting the swales to ponds, we can hold water high in the landscape. Now, because these swales and ponds fill with flood water, it's important to build spillways that cascade to the next contour. And you might be thinking, now, wait a minute, doesn't this risk a landslide? Now, in a very extreme situation, that's always a possibility, but these systems provide the most soakage at each contour so that the amount of water arriving downhill from each swale is less than it would be without a swale. So the net effect is far less water volume and far lower speeds of flooding than you'd have without the swales. Now, as recovery efforts work down into previously settled areas, it's important to renaturalize buried creeks and channelized rivers for reasons that will become clear in the next few slides. We also need to remove pavements to increase permeability and dig new water retention creek beds. These are all well-proven technologies that are familiar to the million-plus people throughout the world who hold a permaculture design certificate. And they're also familiar to millions more people who need to use earthworks on construction sites. Now, the whole point of reshaping the landscape is to rehydrate it. And this is conceptually a very big hurdle for many people because we tend to think of cities as objects. And in that paradigm, plants compete for water resources and provide fuel for fire. And this is a narrative that you'll hear all the time, especially after fires. However, cities, water, and forests are all living processes. And in the life paradigm, a proper forest mix thrives in living layers. 
That is to say, plants and animals find ways to benefit from one another's presence in multiple ways. It also buffers floods and droughts by directly storing water in the trunks and root systems of trees, as well as by creating duff from the leaf litter and pore spaces in the soil to store water long enough for it to trickle down to the aquifers. Forests also more than double precipitation, and this is a huge surprise for most people. It's possible you may have heard of how many trees emit pollen and bacterial and fungal spores that can seed clouds, but they actually have a more direct way of increasing precipitation as well. At night, when the air cools, water condenses on the leaves of trees and drips down to the forest floor. This effectively doubles the precipitation received from rain. And this too helps to recharge groundwater. As the groundwater recharges, the downslope spring lines come back to life and can be tapped for irrigation and firefighting. This is not merely a forest process. In the city, we can rehydrate with living ground covers. As you can see in this figure from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, these reduce runoff by up to 82%. They recharge the groundwater five times faster, and they increase the soil moisture two and a half fold. Now, implicit in our rehydration plan is reforestation. These need to be timed for the start of the rainy season, when rain is actually in the forecast. We plant along soft swale mounds on slopes less than 18 degrees, or we use net and pan plantings on the steeper slopes, as illustrated in this figure from Bill Mollison's Permaculture Designer's Manual. It's also helpful to inoculate soils with compost teas to reactivate the microbial sponge that makes the soils more able to absorb rainwater, and then begin planting native fire-resistant species, of which there are thousands in California. The important thing is to establish at least three layers, a cover crop, a shrub layer, and a tree layer. Many choices exist. And here it's a good idea to consult ecological natives. And by this I mean people whose history in the area dates back to a time when the living biomass was 10 to 100 times greater. To the degree that they've retained their ancestral knowledge, they will be a good source of information about how to reassemble ecosystems in the region using the abundance of native species that exist in the area. And then finally, a few seasons down the road, it's good to reintroduce wildlife. Beavers, for example, and their dams are amazing at rehydrating landscapes. It might also be a good idea to investigate reintroducing wolves, which limit deer browse, not as most people might think, by simply hunting them and reducing their numbers. No, in fact, in Yellowstone National Park, when they reintroduced wolves, one of the surprises was that it increased, not decreased, the elk population, but the presence of wolves kept the elk on the move so that they wouldn't overbrowse the willows that were so important for other species such as beavers to survive the winter and build their dams, which increased overall water retention in the region and made the rivers more vibrant. Now, in the case of Los Angeles, the species, climate, and landscape relationships are different, but it is true that wolves and beavers once roamed the area freely. Can you see how starting to rebuild the local ecology can rehydrate the landscape and bring it back to life? Now, these steps may seem really intense, really disruptive of the status quo, but understand what's really happening here. We're talking about bringing back to life a landscape that was largely sterilized by how we build cities today. So our next step in permanently fireproofing LA is to redevelop the burned areas. This slide shows the area burned by the Eaton Fire, which burned a large portion of Altadena. We're looking from Pasadena up toward Altadena right here. Okay, let's have a look at that burnt area. You can see that the devastation is just terrible. It's block after block, completely destroyed, just nothing left. For anybody who lost everything they had, this is just an unbelievable tragedy. You just want people to be able to get their lives back as best they can, as quick as they can. So everything that we're talking about today needs to be part of a longer-term plan. Because when things like this happen again, possibly in this area again, we need to have plans in place to rehydrate these landscapes. I'm going to walk you through the basic strategy on the left and then a bit about where it fits into the Edenicity framework. Our first step is to remove most roads, parking lots, and other hard surfaces from the burned area. Reforest the entire upper half of the previously settled burned area after putting in swales and water retention basins. Then we Edenize the lower, flatter half with car-free, transit-oriented development. This is mixed-use, multifamily housing in a layered gardened landscape with Mediterranean rooftop gardens, orchards, farm belts, and forest belts, again with more water retention basins 
to handle future flood events. And then finally, to connect everything up with tramways and bike paths that are sheltered with solar panels. Now, again, if you're not familiar with Edenicity, I know this seems to be coming right out of left field, but you can get caught up by downloading the land use concept from the link in the description. One of the features of that land use concept is the Edenicity town, which is a basic urban unit where you can meet most of your needs. I pictured one at the top here so you can see the size of it compared to Altadena, and it's almost big enough to fit the entire population of Altadena and Pasadena in that much smaller area. Now, the Edenicity town is composed of 25 or so villages of about 6,000 people. That turns out to be a very nice working unit. You can have uh, grade schools with full classes at that population level, and about 25 blocks of buildings built to about three stories. These are mixed use with apartments over commercial spaces, very similar to brownstone neighborhoods that are very popular in New York City and many other cities today. Now, the six highlighted villages in the town center in this schematic are big enough to fit the entire population of Altadena. It also shows you how the bikeway and tramways work, as well as the farm belts and tree belts that help to hydrate the landscape and provide food for residents. And just for reference, there's room in greater Los Angeles to house nearly twice as many people in Edenicity developments as currently reside in LA today. All right, let's see how the Edenicity town fits into rebuilding Altadena. And again, this is just as an example. The groundwork for something like this needs to be laid well in advance. People need to have input and buy-in into the process, and I'll detail how to do that in a later episode. This was my first attempt at it, to sort of looking up from above, a forest belt right up against the foothills, the farm belt around the villages, a temporary town center built to three stories rather than the nominal eight for an Edenicity town center, because I realized that it would probably grow its way down the hill as neighborhoods that were all built at the same time start to reach their expiration dates. But then I remembered the area. I lived in Pasadena to the south and got around by bicycle as much as I could. What I recalled was that above East Washington Boulevard, it got very steep. Let me show you how bad it is. So south of East Washington Boulevard, when I looked at the U.S. Geological Survey topographic maps, I figured out that the slopes were about 2%, which is fine for bicycle riding. That's quite comfortable. But above, it got to about 3.5 degrees, which gets a little bit uncomfortable. And as we get up above Altadena Avenue, we're looking at about a 5-degree climb. Most people would be pushing their bikes or would require an e-bike. The point is that it is a challenge to build something very walkable on such steep slopes. And it's also hard to get the ecology right to control erosion and handle runoff. The materials and forces at play gather momentum very quickly in such an environment. Long term, it would be much better for redevelopment to happen to the south of East Washington Boulevard. So those top three villages from version 0.1 of this design are just basically too steep to be walkable. So it would be better in the long term to plan to shift the population south to Pasadena. This is a design that puts all of the inhabited areas south of East Washington Boulevard and has enough villages to house the populations of both Altadena and Pasadena. And by the way, those areas have been losing population very slightly for the past 20 years at a time when the LA basin itself grew by 2 million people. It's a sign that the region could be getting ripe for renewal. In this design, I put the town center on the Lake Avenue stop of the A-Line on the LA Metro, which didn't exist when I lived there. But if it's anticipated that the region would grow to the east, and the town center should shift one stop to the east as well. This process of Edenizing a city seems drastic, but this is how we can truly fireproof a city by restoring the water cycle, make it healthier and safer by making it car-free and mass transit-oriented. And again, most people have no idea how much safer mass transit is. We're talking 17 to 50 times safer than getting around by car. Trains that are completely separated from car traffic, such as Japan's Shinkansen, are up to 800 times safer than getting around by car. Without car alarms, horns, revving engines, and that steady roar of tires rolling on pavement, an Edenized city would be four times quieter to live in, as well as far more convenient because many more of your daily needs are available within an easy walk of your home, and of course, far more affordable because your transportation expenses are a tenth of what they would be owning a private car, and because of the innate material and energy efficiencies of apartment living. But making this available for people takes political will and tested organizational strategies. How do we develop these? I'll talk about that in the next episode. Just as a quick reminder, here's that land use concept that you can download from the link in the description. Tap or click here to learn more about Edenicity. And thanks as always to the wonderful patrons for supporting this work. Take care, stay green, see you next time.